this evening is going to work a little bit differently to our normal Robert Winston lectures. We're going to do it more as a conversational style and then we'll move into questions um, towards the end. So, Christy, how would you describe yourself and what matters most to you? Gosh, what a question to start with. <laughs> Can everybody hear me at the back? It, it might, if I start mumbling, do, do raise your hands. Um, thank you all for coming out on such a cold, cold evening. <laughs> um, what matters most to me? I, I've been asked this recently for a podcast, actually, and it, they asked the question, what is most sacred to you? And I think um, my answer's really changed because um, I've been thinking a lot about compassion, and compassion should be the answer that I give, really. But I think what, what is most sacred to me at the moment is humour. And I think that humour matters so much to me. And I think increasingly, the sadder that the months go on and the more sort of tragedy that we hear about from the news, um, I think we're living in a time of great suffering. I think the more I really value humour, joy, love, laughter, and all those joyous things, and hope as well. So those are the things that I'm all about at the moment. I don't really want to... Uh, watch the news, I don't want to listen to the news, <laughs> I don't want to engage with the news. Um, I want to watch nice Christmas films and um, eat, eat Quality Street in my pyjamas. <laughs> I mean, that might sound lazy, but I feel like that's the space I'm in, and I, I'm okay. all about honesty as well. So, okay. yeah, that's what matters. So, your favourite right. Quality Street, then? Purple. <laughs> Purple? Yes. Nice. Anyone oh, yes, oh, yes, yeah, some yeah, definite yeah. nods in the audience. Sorry, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, you've not always wanted to be a nurse. So no. take us through that journey that led you to becoming an S. Yeah, some of your students asked me earlier about, about my sort of um, career, early career and what made me choose to be a nurse and I think I fell into it. I, I was one of those really precocious teens that changed and was really fickle and I changed my idea about who I was and what I wanted to be every half an hour it seemed. I went through um, every career idea you can imagine, jazz trumpeter, marine biologist, I'm still interested in marine biology, um, astronomer, lawyer, scientist, journalist, and every week it was something different. And then um, I couldn't really settle, I couldn't think of what I wanted to be, and I found myself volunteering in a care home, and I was working with nurses for the first time. And I remember just thinking that the work that they were doing and watching them, and I was only 16, but I remember feeling such awe about what they were doing and it just felt like they were having such a remarkable impact on people's lives with sometimes just tiny little details and it felt like magic to me mm. and so I fell into nursing at the age of 17 and yeah it was like magic and it was like getting to live a thousand different lives all the time because you were coming to contact with people from all walks of life. So it really suited my kind of flighty nature, I think. <laughs> Very good. Um, so ER, ER was something you quite enjoyed watching. Yes. Um, any other kind of medical TV shows that you kind of enjoyed? And is it anything like it? So, yeah, I, I watched a lot of ER thinking that that's what my life would be like. And I imagine George Clooney on every ward, <laughs> just sort of <laughs> hanging around. <laughs> I never once met George Clooney type <laughs> person. Um, uh, but obviously the reality of what we are presented with in the media and on television in terms of medical drama is very, very different from, uh, from, from how it really is. But I would say that ER is one of the closest, actually, of all the medical dramas I've seen. And, and because I'm trying to write medical drama at the moment, um, I'm watching a lot of medical drama, and some of it's truly far from the truth and some of it is a little bit more close to the truth but it's really hard to adapt what's going on in real life to mm -hmm. something that we can present on television and certainly I've never been in a resuscitation scenario where yeah. somebody's been defibrillated and then just sort of sat up and said thank you doctor <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't happen like that. no <laughs> sadly so as you went into nursing you had this magical idea about what nursing was going to be like but that radically changed didn't it so can you give us, kind of walk us through that and maybe talk to us a bit about Betty? Yeah, so I did think it would be about cracking chests and saving lives at all costs and about ER type situations and accident and emergency resuscitation and all that sort of sexy glamorous side of the, what I imagined uh, nursing would be. Um, and really 
what I learned is that nursing is about compassion and it's about kindness and it's, and it's primarily about dignity. And those things are not glamorous, but they are so, so important. And so as I kind of got a bit of life experience, my, my attitude uh, towards not only nursing, but what it means to be human completely changed, really. And it was meeting patients like, like Betty. Um, Betty, I talk about a lot. I wrote about Betty in the language of kindness. And I think she is the patient that stayed with me most up to now because she really taught me what it means to be a nurse and how important it is. And she was elderly and she was frail and she was alone and she'd come into hospital with chest pain. I talked to some of your students about her earlier. And she, um, she was on a trolley in a corridor outside accident and emergency when I, when I looked after her. We had something called corridor nurse that day, if you can imagine, that's how understaffed we were. Um, and I was the corridor nurse. And um, yeah, it, it, it was really difficult because we thought she was having a big heart attack. And so we did all the usual things, 12 lead ECG, bloods, all the, all the normal things you do. And nothing was showing up. And, but she was very, very cold. So I found this uh, machine that we call, we called it a bear hugger machine, which was like a sort of billowing fabric that goes over a patient and warms them up. And she, I sat with her and I held her hand and made her a cup of tea and stuff. And she said, um, she started talking about her husband, Stan, and how the fabric reminded her of her wedding dress, which is a, made from parachute silk. And it turned out that her husband, Stan, had died in the hospital two weeks before. Yeah. And then she started describing her pain, her heart pain, and that's what brought her into hospital. And she wasn't talking about chest pain at all. She was talking about heart pain and sadness and grief. And, it just taught me so much because we'd been so tunnel visioned and focused on medicalizing and pathologizing and trying to get to the root cause of her suffering. And really her suffering could only be cured with compassion because she was suffering from something that wasn't medical in origin, it was emotional. So, so where did you go with her then? So you're there, you, you, am I right in thinking the first bit you talk about when you hold her hand and can you talk to us a little bit about that and the impact that had? Yeah, so I mean, I think, again, nursing is a job that looks very easy and simple from the outside, and, and holding a patient's hand is an image that we see when we think about nurses. But of course, while you're holding a patient's hand, you're assessing their heart rate, their respiratory rate, their conscious level, their skin turgor, you're assessing for signs of sepsis, hypothermia, um, things like emotional and social health. You're building a jigsaw puzzle of that patient's life. You're working out who they are, what's important to them. You're thinking about things like staffing on the wards and who's had a break in case she needs to be admitted. So it's kind of a big world that you're, you're doing just while you're holding someone's hand. But of course, to Betty, the important thing was that I was holding her hand. Mm -hmm. And she, um, she said, she kept saying, oh, I've sa you've saved my life after she'd had a sandwich and a cup of tea. Well, of course, I hadn't saved her life at all. But to her, she just was so lonely and just needed to be listened to and she needed mm -hmm. someone to hold her hand. Um, so it was just one of those, uh, it was one of those moments when I, I thought about the importance of compassion and the fact that if I'm lucky I'll be Betty's age one day and I hope that somebody is there holding my hand. And it really made me realise what, what an important job that is. Thank you. Well, one of the things that comes out quite a bit in your book, The Language of Kindness, is the role of a nurse and the importance of character. Bit of a controversial question for you. Um, to be a doctor, we talked about this a little bit earlier, didn't we? You know, one of a really good thing for a doctor to learn to do is to knit. Um, and we kind of talked about kind of the skill, the technical skill that actually doctors you can just learn those things. Mm -hmm. Can anyone be a nurse though? So I think it's important to distinguish that surgeons need to knit. Yeah. And depending on the surgery, an orthopedic surgeon would not need to knit. Maybe hammer. <laughs> so I think before they all go knitting um, I don't think anyone could be a nurse no and I don't think anyone could be a doctor I think that um, you need uh, grit it's, it's something that obviously it's an academic safety critical profession but I think you need to, you need to be a little bit um, able to be really empathetic and walk in someone else's shoes in a way that perhaps you might not be able to learn at school so you need to be a certain kind of person I think to to withstand the suffering that you're going to see and face. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the same in medicine as well. I think not everyone can be a doctor, not everyone can be a nurse. 
and um, some people are sort of born that they are able to do it and some people grow into it but I don't think it's for everybody. Um, so we're talking about the kind of importance of character. You can't just become it. What yeah. built you as a nurse over the years then? What made you into the nurse that you are now? So I think, um, I think tragedy and joy build nurses, um, but in equal measures. Oh, your decorations are falling down. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, it's character building, guys. Um, yeah, tragedy and joy build nurses. But I think also the biggest thing for me uh, that made me a nurse, and I'm not a clinical nurse anymore, but certainly over my career, the thing that helped me the most was my teammates and my colleagues and learning from people that I consider much wiser than I am and nurses who are much older and wiser or more experienced and doctors and allied health professionals, just learning from every member of the team around me and I've been really lucky to have just incredible people to learn from. Mm -hmm. And I think you learn from mistakes as well, you, you, you really do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you learn more from mistakes than when, when thing goes, things go right. So it's a lot about reflection, it's a lot about growing up, and when I say growing up, I don't mean growing up like a child. I mean, you know, I still don't consider myself yeah. a grown up. One day I will grow up, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm striving. Um, yeah. So we learn from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. Things go wrong. Um, what happens when things go wrong then? Well, I think the culture and the, the, um, the organisational culture in the NHS is changing a lot for the better um, in terms of it used to be a sort of culture of hiding mistakes or there was a, a, an attitude of bullying if you did something wrong and I think that has completely vanished, almost completely vanished now and I think people are uh, really able to be transparent and say I'm human, I'm really sorry this happened, let's look at organisational systemic failure and let's look at what led to this and what we can learn from it so that it never happens again because nurses and doctors do make mistakes, they are human beings and um, I think the, the way to cope with that is to is to apologise, but also to be really, really honest and look at why it happened in order that it doesn't happen again. And then personally, how, <coughs> so you, you've said you're sorry, mm -hmm. you go home, you can't sleep. Mm. How, how do you cope with that? I think uh, sleep is a distant memory at the moment for everybody, so it's like how do we all cope with this at the moment? Um, yeah, I think it's interesting, isn't it? it, it Coping mechanisms are really important. I've found that friends and family outside work are really important as well. But there's nothing quite like talking to somebody who was in the room when it happened. And so I feel like there are, there are times when there's things that I would discuss with my colleagues that I would never discuss outside those relationships. Because it would be traumatising for people to listen to. But also, I think there's a sort of gallows humour, there's a kind of dark humour that nurses and doctors kind of develop as a coping mechanism that is really important, actually. It's very important, but you wouldn't want somebody thinking it was insensitive. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about, um, it's about having those relationships where you are in a safe space, able to discuss things that happened in the room with people who were there, um, and then, obviously, it might not be in the middle of the night, but I've certainly phoned colleagues in the middle of the night or had colleagues phone in the middle of the night, particularly during the pandemic, and said, mm. I need to talk to you at 3 o'clock in the morning. And you kind of make a cup of tea and listen. Um, yeah, as you would in any, in any job, I think. You just try and be a support for each other. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so over the years, 20 years, we said paediatric nurse, then on to the resuscitation, resuscitation officer. What would you say... What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned, and have you got any stories that can walk us through those? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I think the biggest lessons I've learned are about the fact that uh, the things that I'd considered perhaps culturally important are not important at all. And um, I think we've had a real shift, particularly in the last 18 months, two years, towards what matters, or back towards what matters. I think in our, in our culture we were moving away from a set of values and almost revering individualism and consumerism and globalisation and, and, and always thinking about the cult of youth and valuing external beauty and things. And I think nursing, but also life, has taught me that none of that matters at all. 
everything is about community and friendship and keeping those people that you love as close as possible and appreciating every single day and it's about the small things that are really the big things so I think that was part of nursing but also part of humanity and part of what it means to be human mm. um, but I, I guess in my nursing career in terms of stories about uh, things that have you know stayed with me there was a, a girl that I wrote about that I've called Charlotte in the book who um, who had uh, sepsis and she was really, really seriously ill. And she um, ended up losing her limbs because she was so ill that, you know, she was almost dying from the outside in. And we, we thought that she would have absolutely no chance of survival. I mean, it took three nurses just to look after her. So three nurses per one patient. Um, and, you know, we had lots of conversations with the family and I remember thinking at the time, just feeling really burnt out, feeling really tired, feeling really quite depressed with the job. Um, and then she just turned a corner and she, and, and she survived and it felt like a miracle. She not only survived, but she came back to visit the nurses and doctors about 18 months later and she had prosthetic limbs and she was going off to school and she was full of joy and <coughs> laughter and just being a normal mm. kid. And it was one of those moments where I remember thinking that for every tragedy and for every sad day, when you work in healthcare or you work in the NHS or in private healthcare, there is a day like that that really lifts you up and you just remember and hang on to those brilliant moments. And you never really know. And, you know, life can surprise you in really bad ways, but it can also surprise you in really amazing, mm. um, amazing ways as well. Thank you. You talk a little bit about how you don't like the word resilience. Mm. Tell us a little bit about that then. I used to like it <laughs> until I wasn't resilient anymore. Um, no, I, I think that we, we've heard, we heard a lot in the early days of the pandemic about, um, about the resilience of healthcare workers. And I think it's unfair to ask healthcare workers to be resilient at this time. It's impossible, actually. And sometimes just getting through the day is enough. And we're asking so much of our nurses and doctors at the moment um, that I feel like it's OK for people not to be resilient. And I'm talking particularly in my own experience in critical care nursing. I think up to 40% of critical care nurses have got PTSD symptoms now, post-beginning post of the pandemic. Um, and so I feel like resilience is a word for people when you know, you're, you're hoping that they'll have a good day and kind of pull their socks up and get on with it and have a tough spirit. That's not where we're at right now. We're at a really traumatic time in healthcare where um, you know, we're asking so much of people. And actually what people need is, is really solid and intensive men mental health support, mm. not just kind of wellness training. There was a... Um, there was, a, a, for example, a notice on the coffee board of somewhere that I worked that said a sign-up for yoga and meditation. Anyone that f fancies the yoga and meditation during break time, please write your name below. We've got an external person coming in. And one of the nurses had written, I didn't pee for 12 hours yesterday. Namaste. And I was thinking, gosh, that is you know pretty reflective of where we're at. I don't think that those kind of supportive measures which are really important are enough. I think we need really mm. lots and lots of psychological support for healthcare workers now. Mm. Nobody's resilient anymore. Brilliant. Yeah. We're going to come on and talk about the pandemic in a bit, but um, <coughs> one of the most striking stories in your book um, is about the palliative care that you experienced with your dad. Can you talk to us about Cheryl and mm. um, kind of the impact she had on your life? Yeah, I think that was the sort of catalyst for... Because I was writing novels up until Language of Kindness, and I always consider myself a novelist. Even now, I consider myself a novelist. Never really wanted to write non-fiction. But it was kind of Cheryl who, who made me want to tell that story, because after so many years working as a nurse as well as a writer, I found myself on the other side of the fence when my dad was dying of lung cancer at 63. He was really young, and it was very quick. And he wanted to die at home, and um, he was able to do that because of a nurse called Cheryl who, who came to help us look after him at home. And obviously I was familiar with, with all that she was doing, but 
suddenly being a daughter and not a nurse and watching the impact of her her skill and her kindness on our whole family it just really took my breath away and she helped my dad with dignity with being who he is till the very last moment I mean they had such a a beautiful funny warm relationship and um it was even though it was the most traumatic thing ever it was quite beautiful to watch their friendship during that time I remember standing outside his bedroom because she'd gone in to change her sheets it was literally like a day before he died and she didn't want me doing it she said you be the daughter I'm going to be the nurse and I heard them roaring with laughter because my dad had sort of rustled, rustled the sheets, moved them over and said, jump in, Cheryl. <laughs> and she's called him a cheeky beggar. Um, and I remember thinking, God, that's such an amazing thing that she's doing. Um, and, Cheryl, and this was, we're talking like nine, ten years ago now, and she still pops in on my mum to see if she's all right. And, you know, it is astonishing when you think that people, nurses and doctors and healthcare workers all over the world give that level of, support to people who are strangers. She made us feel like part of her family and yet we were strangers and yeah, I thought she was, well she is absolutely remarkable and she's the only person in the book who's, who's got her real name because I contacted everybody obviously from a confidentiality point of view and said can I use you, can I use, change your name, can I do this and I said don't worry, I will change your name, I'll change all the details and she said no, absolutely put my real name in. <laughs> she said I want my real name in. And she said, can you put my surname in as well? I said, no, it would be odd. So her surname's not in there, but she did want the whole thing. And so I felt like she, she felt seen for the first time as well. And it was really lovely to have that relationship with her. Mm. Yeah, she's great. Mm. Then, kind of when you're talking about her in your book, you talk about how, how we treat the most vulnerable in society is a measure of who we are. Mm. Can you talk about that a little bit and link that to nursing for us? Yeah. So it's a saying, I can't remember who said it, it might have even been Gandhi or somebody like that. It's how we treat our most vulnerable is a measure of our society. Um, and I was thinking a lot about that and thinking that if, if how we treat our most vulnerable is a measure of our society, then first of all, we're doing really badly right now. Really badly. But also, if how we treat our vulnerable is a measure of our society, then the act of nursing itself is a measure of our humanity. And how we treat our nurses is also a measure of our humanity. And again, we're doing really badly about that. And um, I guess I was thinking a lot about what humanity means, what it means to be human, who are we as people. And particularly at this time, I feel like we are at a tipping point. We've come to a crossroads. You know, we've climbed this mountain and we're all at a vantage point where we're looking around and saying, that was then, that's who we were. We don't know yet what's coming but we have a chance to change here. And I feel like, you know, we're bombarded with these tragedies. And COVID opened our eyes to all the other pandemics of racism, loneliness, poverty, <coughs> violence, gender-based violence, all the things, mental health, all the things that we know about that already existed. But it's almost like we've been shaken awake by COVID. And we do have an opportunity as human beings, all of us, to say, okay, who are we? Who are we meant to be? Is this right, you know, what we're doing and how we treat each other? And I feel like there has been a shift, and particularly those early days when there was a real sense, I think, of community and what's important and people coming together and kind of picking up food parcels for their neighbours or, you know, everyone doing their own bit in their own way because it's not just about healthcare workers in hospitals. I think everybody became a community again and started caring for people in a way that was really beautiful, actually, mm. which is a, a nice thing that's come out of this awful time. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Then, so in your book, you then talk <coughs> about the struggle you had after you died going back into work. You kind of felt that maybe you went back to work too soon. Mm. Um, can you share a little bit about that with us? Yeah, so uh, after my dad died, I went back I think like within four days or something. And the reason I did, I was working as a resuscitation officer um, and so I was dealing with people who, were, who had died basically and I, I felt like I wouldn't be able to do the job again ever unless I went back quite quickly. It was almost like now or never I've got to come back. I said to my boss, because he said, I don't think you should be back yet. And I said, no, I really have to, otherwise I'll never come back. Um, and inevitably the first 
medical rash call that I got was to the oncology ward and so it was just really really traumatic and um, I ended up crying and I remember the patient that was a kind of false alarm and he, he just basically said to me I was kept apologising and saying I'm so sorry I'm so sorry I realised I was back too soon and I was crying all over him. It was kind of that kind of crying, you know, where you're like snot coming out and like, you know, it was just proper crying um, and just really sobbing on him. And this poor patient was just thinking, oh my gosh, it's a nurse. Um, but he kept saying, we're all, in, we're all in this together. Don't worry about it. You know, we're all in this. Don't worry, you cry, you cry. And so I was sobbing on this poor man's shoulder for ages. Um, but yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think it was a good thing that I went back, even though... I cried everywhere <laughs> for a while and sometimes crying is really good you know I think you some things are just really really sad and um, he was the only patient I cried all over so I felt like I did quite a good job keeping it together <laughs> thank you um, you recently gave a TED talk in Vienna mm. um, very closely linked to your, your latest book Courage to Care um, and you talk about the centralness of compassion and how compassion is so important in absolutely everything mm. Again, can you, can you talk to us about that? Yeah. So, I, yeah, I was in Vienna. It was about four days before they locked the whole country down again. So I felt like just got there just in time. Um, and my talk was about the idea that compassion comes from the Latin to suffer with. And we are suffering together, even though we're all suffering in different ways at this time, we are suffering together. So although we are living in this time of suffering, what goes along with that is compassion, <coughs> what's central to that is compassion. And I think the danger of, of this time is not necessarily division and hatred, which is what people are very worried about, and polarisation, but the danger of this time is apathy, it's when we stop feeling, it's when we stop crying all over the place. Um, and because to suffer, the word to suffer actually comes from to feel keenly. And so if we don't feel, we don't suffer. If we don't suffer, we can't be compassionate. And it's all linked. And so I, I guess the theme of my talk was the fact that we need to feel all the feelings, even the really hard feelings, mm -hmm. in order that we remember what's important, which is that we're compassionate towards, towards each other and towards ourselves as well. Thank you. One of your big themes as well is about um, embracing the mess of life rather than avoiding it. Mm. Why do you think that's so important? I think I'm a natural perfectionist um, and I'm a recovering perfectionist, I see. Um, and for a long time I didn't like too many messy things and then I realised that life is messy and there is magic in the mess. And I quite like the sticky margins of life where things go wrong. Um, I did a podcast recently with Elizabeth Day. I just saw your book on the shelf. And she, she does a podcast called How to Fail. Yeah. And she talks a lot about the beauty of failure. And I think increasingly I realise that actually it is in failure that we learn so much about ourselves. And it's in the mess. It's in the messy parts. Um, I think the beauty of this time that we're living in, for me, is that whereas before I would say to my friends or family or strangers, how are you? And they would say, oh, you know, I'm fine. And I'd say, oh, I'm fine too. And if you ask someone now at the bus stop or in your family or friendship groups, how are you? People say, oh, terrible. Oh, <laughs> you know, I feel awful. Or oh, I didn't sleep last night because I was worried about this. Or I didn't. We feel like we're in a really honest place. There's so much truth and honesty in where we are right now and how we're communicating it with each other. And the moment you say to somebody, I'm really not fine, they are able to say back to you, I'm really not fine. And you can be together for a hot moment in that messy space, which is a human space, because it's vulnerability that makes us most human. And I feel like we're very vulnerable at the moment. And that's why I quite like the mess. I'm trying to embrace the mess, even as a perfectionist. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, can nursing save us? Cool. A big question. Um, I don't. I think. I think when when I was talking about Betty saying you saved my life, I think I talked a lot about the fact that I, I understand what she was getting at. I don't think nursing itself can save us, but I think that compassion is the only thing that can save us actually, because science can cure us sometimes. 
Sometimes science can cure us, but compassion can always save us. Um, and so I've got a friend who is a clinical oncologist and he works with uh, lots and lots of patients who are going through horrendous treatments and really, really tragic times of their lives. And he always talks about the importance of compassion, the importance of art, the importance of listening, the importance of empathy, because he said the fact is that many, if not most, of the people that he works with will not be cured by science, but they will be saved by something else. And it is that human connection and empathy. And, you know, I think that compassion is probably the thing that will save us. Yeah. Thank you. You also talk a lot about a nurse's sixth sense. Yeah. There's been research done, actually, about intuition in nurses. And it's weird because um, I've worked with nurses in the past that would go on to an intensive care unit and there'll be a big room like this full of patients and they will just walk immediately over to the person who has the same numbers on their monitor as everybody else, and then that patient will just go into cardiac arrest or something will happen. And it's like they just know. Um, and I always thought that is something about wisdom, it's something about uh, experience, but actually there's science in it as well. And it's something about the fact that they have seen the numbers, they have seen the colour of the patient's skin for so many years that they can very quickly recognise when somebody changes colour even the slightest way. Um, there's something called arterial blood tests that you can do to test oxygen in people's blood in intensive care. And we have a machine that runs the blood called an <coughs> arterial blood gas analyzer. And nine times out of 10, it's not working or it's calibrating. And it always is not working when you really need it most. And so one of the consultants uh, who I worked with for years, he used to take arterial blood gases, which was really important, we know these numbers, and if the machine wasn't working, he would go up to a nurse colleague of mine and say, Tracy, what's the oxygen level in that blood? And she'd look at it and she'd say, whatever. And it was 100% accurate. <laughs> and he'd always check afterwards when the machine stopped calibrating. But she was his first machine. She, he always went to her first. And he always went her, to her for maths as well. Mm -hmm. He didn't trust his calculator. But he'd ask her, what is the you know, um, micrograms per kilogram per minute of this drug? And she'd know. Brilliant. So I think that's just experience. Brilliant, thank you. So you, you've been in the NHS a, you know, quite a substantial amount of time. You've seen a lot of change. Yeah. What do you think are some of the most significant changes that you've experienced? I think that uh, the changes have, have come from wider society and our patients now are totally different. So when I started nursing at the age of 17, um, patients would come in with one problem, physically, usually, they would have medication and they'd get better and they'd go home. Now patients come in with about 20 different problems, physically, emotionally, socially, mentally, and people are tangled balls of all sorts of different needs. And so what's happened is society has changed, patients have changed, and the system hasn't really caught up with it. So. Um, I think it's, I think the nature of who we are and the nature of suffering has changed and that is about not only NHS services being cut but things like, for example, I looked after a, a woman in intensive care who was really, really unwell and um, when I looked back in her notes and started going backwards and working backwards to what had happened, uh, she, Meals on Wheels had been cancelled and after Meals on Wheels had been cancelled, she didn't leave the house, she didn't see anyone, she didn't eat properly. So then her diabetes became uncontrolled. And when her diabetes became uncontrolled, then her COPD. Eventually she ended up very sick in intensive care. But probably the reason that she was in intensive care was that her wheel, Meals on Wheels had been cancelled two weeks before. Now that seems like a very minor thing, but actually the consequences of these minor things that have major implications for people who are literally on the edge of developing illness or mm. becoming sick because they rely so heavily on things like that. Mm. So yeah, I think society has is, is changed. And then linked to that, you talk <coughs> quite a bit about um, faith and trust and mis you know, adversity. Mm. Why do you think that's so key and what does it mean? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> faith and trust in adversity. I think, again, it's back to the failure thing. It's back to the idea that 
um, uh, you know, when we when things go wrong, I'm not talking about systems, but I'm talking about individuals usually learn from those things that have gone wrong in their life. And I'm thinking back to when I was a junior nurse, when I was obsessed with the idea of saving lives at all costs and cracking chests and George Clooney and ER and all those things. Um, partly it was adversity and it was, it was seeing suffering up close and suffering myself that enabled me to develop compassion and have a bit more faith in human beings, I think. Um, so yeah, I think it's some kind of loss of false optimism and some type of, type of understanding of what is really important. Mm. And I think sometimes you can only understand that when you've been through things. It becomes a bit more stark. Thank you. Now, you <coughs> move from nursing to writing. Yeah. You see the two as quite similar things, don't you? Mm. Can you talk to us a little bit about the similarities between nursing and writing and what took you into into writing rather than being just in nursing? Yeah. So I started writing at the age of 30 um, and was still, I was working in paediatric intensive care as a nurse and I carried on writing and nursing for a long time. And for me, both things are about story. They're about the fact that we're all made of flesh and bones and blood, but actually we're all full of stories and that is what makes us unique and it's what we also share. And so there was a lot of crossover. I found that writing was helping my nursing and nursing was helping my writing, but in both places, the thing that was absolutely key is listening to people's stories and understanding narrative and understanding people's stories. Um, and I quite liked the idea that, um, you know, for me, it was really important as a writer to be surrounded by stories the whole time. Actually, during the pandemic, it's been really difficult to write. And lots of writer friends that I've got have found it really difficult because you need that, you need to magpie how someone walks, um, how someone tied their hair up, you know, all these little things that you collect over the day in order to make your writing come alive. But certainly, I feel like the two really helped each other. Mm. And you see a lot of doc doctor writers, particularly in the US, um, very few <coughs> nurse writers here, but I think it's changing. Thank you. What would be your top tip for someone wanting to go into a career in medicine? And what would be your top tip for someone wanting to become a writer? Um, I think both things I would recommend reading fiction and poetry and trying to understand the nature of suffering by looking at art. Um, I think top tips for both of those professions are to really, you know, be interested in human beings, essentially. That's what both of the jobs entail. They're to be really fascinated by not only people's physicality, but the whole jigsaw puzzle of people's lives and what makes somebody human and what interests they have. And actually, the pandemic, one of the hardest things for me was the dehumanisation of the whole time, particularly in the early uh, peak when, you know, we used to put patients on their tummies to help their breathing, so we proned them. So of course they were attached to ventilators and monitors, there was no family, and patients were face down, and the nurses had full PPE. So people were faceless, they were voiceless, and it was dehumanising. Um, and what the nurses did where I worked is they started pu putting up photographs um, and making phone calls to the families every day and putting messages up behind the board of the patients so that people would realise who is this person? Okay, their saturation level might be 88 in 94% oxygen. That's one aspect of medicine. That's one aspect of story if you were writing. But the fact that their name is John and they're obsessed with Tottenham Hotspur is a much more interesting thing. And that's what makes them and that's what makes somebody human. Because the other stuff's easy. It's about finding out who that person is in both writing and medicine. I think that's the key. <coughs> Thank you very much. So you've recently gone back into nursing, so the pandemic took you back in and you've written a little bit about how it was the courage of your children that drew you to do that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think like everybody, um, well, uh, when, when Covid happened I started getting phone calls or text messages from people saying, uh, have you polished off your shoes and got your uniform out yet? 
in a sort of jokey way. You know, when it very first happened, when it was about February, we just started hearing about this thing. I think at that stage, people were saying, oh, you know, it's being overblown. It was kind of, it was, it was on the peripheries of our understanding. Um, and I was joking and sort of texting people back and saying, only if the world is about to end. Like, uh, only if only then. And then, of course, the world was about to end, so I kind of just had to. But I said, to, it was a really awful time, because I think it, at, that, at the very beginning of the peak, um, when we were going into healthcare, we didn't really know about this disease. We just knew it was killing people indiscriminately. I think everybody that worked in the hospital, we all thought we were going to die. And so, like all healthcare workers around the world, I'm sure, before I went back to work, the night before, I sat down and I made sure I'd written my will and stuff like that. You know, that's the reality of it. And of course, I have children, had a big decision to make. I wasn't going to go back. Um, I discussed it with them and I said, you know, I think because I'm a critical care nurse, I think I might be able to help. I might be a hindrance. I'm not sure. I might not be that much help. Um, people are asking me to go back. How do you feel about it? And they said, will you help people? I said, well, hopefully. And they just immediately said, go. You know, we want you to go. You must go. In their mind, you must go. It's not even a question. And so I didn't feel brave at all. I had no courage, zero. I felt absolutely terrified. But for them, I almost... I could see in their eyes that they wanted me to do it and it made them feel proud. And I wanted them to have that, whatever happened. And I look back and think, I'm not sure if it was the right decision or not, even now. Even now, I don't know. But it felt like a decision that I made uh, with them. And they would still say they're still, pla they're still pleased that I went back. It was really traumatic. But, of course, I played a very, very tiny, teeny, tiny part. And there are nurses and doctors who've worked the entire way through and who are still working. You know, I worked with people who had been away from their families living in hotel rooms for three or four months mm -hmm. because they didn't want to go back to their families or bring it home. And, you know, I feel like I did a tiny thing and there are people out there doing much more and continuing to do much more as we go into this winter period. So as you were there <coughs> in one of the first Nightingale hospitals, and you've now come away from that. What are some of your lasting memories of that experience? Um, I mean, it felt like a film, to be honest. It felt like a film because it was in a giant warehouse. Um, we'd made the hospital in nine days, which is, feels just bizarre. But I think the memory, my memory is just my colleagues who were incredible. I was working with absolutely incredible people and it was a kind of pick and mix because we were bringing in people from all over different walks of life to try and learn to be critical care nurses because that's what we were short of. So we had con consultant orthopaedic surgeons I was working with. Uh, we, we had dentists. We had cabin crew. I mean, it was really, you know, I remember a conversation when we opened and saying to my colleagues, look, I think we're going to have vets at this stage. You know, we really did think we were going to have vets coming in as well. And I was saying to them, if I, if I have a choice between a dentist and a vet and I get, end up ventilated, I want a vet. And <laughs> actually, the dentists were brilliant. So I take it back. Um, but yeah, it was, really, it was really terrifying. And I, I think that the thing that was amazing to me is that for all my looking back and thinking it was shocking and how are we going to do this and how can we pull in these people from all these different jobs, they were incredible, absolutely incredible and they saved lives, and they were brilliant teammates. And to throw a team together like that really, really quickly, I think the thing that I'll take away, and the learning I think that's been taken into the wider NHS, is that we were so agile, decisions were made, there was no red tape. It was, if you see a problem, discuss it with the team, and let's fix it now. There's no meeting next week, there's no meeting in three weeks, there's no kind of approval system because it was literally life and death. It was like, right, we're all gonna, if we see a problem, let's fix it, let's do it together. And it was a really radical way of working that I think is going to change the way that the NHS functions, actually. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was the people. People were amazing. Thank you. One last question from me then, before <clears throat> we kind of open up to your questions. Are there any positives we can take from COVID? Oh, I think lots, <coughs> lots of positives. Um, I think it has been a tragic time of great suffering, but it's also a time when we have reevaluated who we are. 
and I think people really, really keep their families close now. I think a lot of my friends and family, and I don't know about everyone here, but are making quite radical changes to their life. They're kind of, you know, been shaken awake to, this, to the point where they're saying, actually, I didn't really like my career. I'm going to make a huge change and do something totally different. Or I didn't really like living in the city. We're going to move to the countryside. And life is very, very short, and we don't know what's around the corner. And that's terrifying knowledge, but it's also a gift. It's a gift to be walking around with your eyes wide open like that and to have that realisation that this is a very, very precarious but incredibly precious life that we have and we've got one. And I think that is a beautiful thing to come out of this pandemic. Great, thank you so much. Now, have, let's, let's get, uh, come over to your questions then. So has anyone got any questions they'd like to ask Chrissy? Um, after Chris has asked your, answered your questions, uh, we'll move on to some book um, selling and signing at the back if you'd like to. So, any questions for Christy before we finish this evening? Um, hello. Hello. Uh, so, when you were talking about uh, Cheryl with your dad and the friendship that they made, it made me wonder do, have you ever uh, made uh, regretted making friendships with uh, patients who uh, have died and the subsequent grief that you felt and have you ever felt the urge to detach yourself emotionally from dying patients to save yourself from the grief? I think that's a brilliant question. Does everyone oh, hear that? that? Yeah, <laughs> it's a fantastic question. I think I used to think that that was really important, that I was detached so that I was protecting myself. And I think actually the language of medicine is a language of detachment in order to protect the clinician. And when we use certain medical language, we're doing it as a way of protecting ourselves from speaking in a plain way, because then it's us and them, not us and us. And that is a very difficult thing for people to come to terms with. And I feel like now, and all of my colleagues are sort of moving towards a space where we are a bit more open to the idea that it's us and us, and also that it is really painful to lose a patient, but you do have to give yourself that pain, and you do have to go through that pain in order to build relationships that are obviously um, professional relationships with patients, but also I think that you have to um, give that little bit extra of yourself and not be detached so that you build something therapeutically, because if someone's detached with you, then you can really feel it, I think. Um, and when somebody's being open and honest with you, I, I think when you express to a patient your, part of yourself, that is really helpful for them as well. And it is about that kind of dance between patient and clinician. And I think removing those barriers is really, really important. So when I was younger, yes, I felt like it was really good to be detached. And now I think it's a really harmful thing, not only to the clinician, but to the patient as well. Thank you. Brilliant. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes. If you're on this list of potential career choices, do you think you made the right choice? And if you did or you didn't, which career choice would you take if you had the time over again? Oh, that's a great question as well. So I remember going for an interview at Pizza Hut in Stevenage to be, <laughs> to be the children's entertainer. <coughs> and I was 16 and a half, half three important, and I remember saying to my dad, this is it. This is what I want to do with my <coughs> life. And so I, I spent the whole day on a day trial. I was dressed as a clown. And I had an interview at the end of the day. And I remember saying, to, it, was a, it was a panel, believe it or not, <laughs> interviewing me. And I remember saying that I'd made these uh, balloon poodles. And I thought, I've got this job. This is my dream job. And they said... Uh, we're afraid to say that you haven't got the job. We didn't think you were that funny. <laughs> and I remember crying. Okay, I remember crying to my dad in an underpass around the corner because I told him to wait around the corner because I thought he was being embarrassing. And I just cried and cried. And how he didn't laugh, I don't know, to this day, because he was consoling me and I said, my life is ruined. That's it. I've got no life choices. That's it. I'm never going to be a, a clown. Um, <laughs> and he was sort of saying, don't worry, you'll be a clown if you want to be a clown. It's OK. Um, but yes, I remember thinking, I am so glad about all the choices that didn't happen. I'm so glad I wasn't a clown. 
I'm so glad I wasn't all the other things that I thought I would be. And actually, you asked me a question earlier. I can't remember your name, sorry. Mitchell. Mitchell asked me a question earlier about, you know, what, what's, what, what was the question you asked me? Like how important the choices you make. How important the choices you make are now at this age. And, and the answer really in a school environment would be, you know, take it seriously, it's very important for your future, as I just said. And I said, not at all important. And I think that is a sort of illustration of not, not important. I mean, obviously they are important, but for me, I feel like the choices I made at that age would have been pretty bad. And so sometimes it's about the failures that, that make you, yeah. Brilliant. I really wanted that job. Yes. <laughs> um, obviously, since over the years, the training for nurses has changed and it yeah. went through that nurses now have to take a degree. Yeah. Do you think that we've lost some very good nurses because they don't have the academic ability but have the like bountiful compassion within them? Do you feel that maybe that we've lost some people in society who have done very good jobs in nurse in the old system but weren't able to get through academically? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. Um, the short answer to that is that nursing now is a degree profession for a very good reason. And it's because you've got the patient coming in with 17 comorbidities. It's safety critical. It's a safety critical profession. Nurses are diagnosing, they're prescribing, they're treating. Um, they are doing nurse-led retrievals, for example. They're training doctors often. So the answer is that to be a nurse now, in the landscape that we're dealing with now, you absolutely need a degree. And most nurses I, I know have not only got a degree, they've got a master's, they're, they're doing PhDs, so they're actually doctors as well, but of nursing. Um, I think that the, the types of patients that we see now, it's, it is, it's much more than just being compassionate. And I think if you've got somebody who's really compassionate, but maybe not very academic, then uh, there are lots of different things like nursing assistant or healthcare assistant or carer, which would be absolutely brilliant and really, really important and valuable as well. But yeah, to, to be a nurse, you absolutely need a degree now. It, the job requires it. <coughs> yes. Hi, one of the issues that uh, we don't talk about with regard to COVID in the United States is that many of the people that get COVID haven't taken very good care of themselves throughout the course of their lives. <clears throat> taken up bad habits or they've gained weight or you know they're high. Many of these things are not things that the individual can control, but it goes without saying that in the United States people are overweight in many cases. And in your sense of compassion, I wonder you know whether you feel that uh, while society we all have to sort of help each other, while the individual also needs to take more responsibility for how they treat themselves. Uh, in terms of their physical uh, effort to try to be shapeless and try to reduce the bad habits that they, that they might have. How you dealt with that as you're dealing with people in the, in the nursing room? Yeah, I think it's very interesting because when you're working with vulnerable people from all sorts of areas of, of life, particularly friends that are working in, for example, district nursing in communities or they're working in forensic nursing. So one of the nurses that I mentioned in the book Jess, who works in a forensic nursing setting, she works in prison, she works in police cells, she works with people who have, who have not taken care of themselves to the extreme, to the point where they're, they're having substance misuse, um, they might be uh, you know, living very, very chaotic lives. And I think it's back to the meals on wheels. If you trace back, if you go back in someone's life and go backwards and see where people came from and had the same hand of cards that they had, you'd be in the same place they were in, and so would I. And I think it's the same with all sorts of lifestyle choices. It's about helping the individual to make the right choice, but also having a really good understanding of what led to that in the first place. And I think the more that you have an awareness of going backwards in someone's lives and where those things began, the more empathy, I suppose, that you have for their condition, and the more you can put yourself in their shoes and saying, to be honest, some of those people that she works with, for example, who might have performed cr horrific crimes or done something, I think some of them are the most brave people in the world to, to even still be alive because of their life that they've had. And once you know about it, then you kind of think, wow, on the, on the outside, they look like they're taking from society, but actually what they've been through, my goodness, they are incredibly full of courage. So I, I try not to judge. 
I think that um, being non-judgmental is a really important aspect of nursing and medicine. But of course, everybody has their Achilles heel. And one of the things I talk about in the books is the fact that, you know, I found it really hard to work with people who have been involved in abuse in any way, particularly child abuse or anything like that. So I think being non-judgmental is kind of a goal <laughs> that you have. And it's really important to work backwards. But yeah, we've all got something that we say, oh, that's really difficult for me to work with. Great. Thank you so much. Thank so you. Um, interesting, inspiring, you know, really, really helpful to hear from you. So thank you so much. Now, thank before you. we give you a round of applause, <coughs> before you head to the back, do you want to talk a little bit about your two books and the other books that are available for people to buy? Oh, gosh. Um, everything that I've just said will be in the books. <laughs> <laughs> anything in particular defining the two? Well, that one I hate because it's got me on the front cover. And it was fine because I had a mask on all through COVID. But there's a new cover now, so I'm very happy that I'm not on the front cover. I just go in shops like this, like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. Um, yeah, sorry. Great. Thank you so much. Let's give Christy a round of applause. Oh,